Now that we've established the slab is level, we've come back and filled in places that were uh, low for the subgrade. Now to do that, we've used a three-quarter inch gravel and we've compacted it heavily in uh, at least two directions. You want to try to compact it as much as you can uh, because this is going to be where the structure rests upon. So if this isn't compacted well, you get a lot of cracking in the foundation and in the slab as well. So once we've got that in place, we're going to come in and on top of that, we know for our sub slab, we're going to have about three and a half or four inches of gravel. On top of that, we'll have three inches of rigid insulation. On top of that, an inch to an inch and a half of sand. And finally, on top of that, three and a half inches of concrete. So with this layout in mind, we want to come back in and fill the center of the slab area with about three and a half to four inches of gravel. Different jurisdictions have different requirements for the code in terms of the size of your anchor bolts, the spacing of your anchor bolts, uh, and the size and depth of your footing and so forth. So what we've got here is basically a, a generalized diagram that will give you an idea of how the slab is laid out. Uh, for the specific areas that you want to check your local code, those are identified here on the diagram. Uh, there's two dots at the bottom of the footing. Uh, in my area, this is a number four rebar, a half inch rebar, uh, run horizontally with the joints overlapped uh, 20 inches at least. So again, check your code, see what's required in your area, and then design to that. Uh, in this situation, we've got the rigid insulation placed underneath the slab. This will give us a nice insulative layer between the ground and the concrete itself. There are other ways to do that, which we'll show you in the next diagram. On this diagram, you notice that we have the insulation running vertically on the exterior of the concrete. Now, the, the major disadvantage of this is that it creates an area where you cannot inspect between the ground and the mud sill. You've got insulation running clear up from the ground, and uh, termites and other insects have a pathway behind that insulation, potentially into your structure. The advantage of it is that it uses much less material and uh, still creates an insulation value uh, worth noting on the concrete slab itself. So with our three foot stakes on top of the screed board extending out over the top of the form so we can slide it back and forth, we now sort of saw cut the surface to move high spots down and fill in the lows. Now some lows like we had right through the middle here are not that bad, we don't have to worry about them. As I'm getting to the edge here I can see that there's quite a bit of hole here so if this doesn't fill it as it drops in we'll have to put some more material in and then screed it off to the right level. Okay, so we have two low spots. Let's try that. Now around the edges, we don't have to worry too much about bringing the gravel all the way out because we're actually going to cut this out for our footing with the, uh, the square shovel once we've got this in place. So we'll have a wide footing on this building. So we'll, we won't worry about this. You want to go a little bit further than the, than the width of your footing will actually be so you can compact it and then cut it back out. You don't want the loose material to be sitting right at the edge of your slab. Now we've got all of our gravel screeded off to the basic height where we want it, but it still has to be compacted. So I'm going to use the plate compactor, and I'm going to do a number of passes on this. Again, we've been going in about two to three inch lifts here, so there's not a whole lot to compact, but this is the final bed before we get to the next layers of, of the assembly. So I'm going to go in at, in at least two different directions. I'll probably go over this entire slab about three or four times to make sure that it's fully compacted. Now that all the compaction is done, I want to start cutting out my footings. This is a larger uh, footing than normal. This is a 19 and a half inch wide footing because it's for a load bearing straw bale structure. So I come into the corner and measure out 19 and a half inches and I've placed a screw at an angle at the bottom here. And I've done the same at the other end and in front of every corner I measure out that distance, 19 and a half inches. I can then run string lines from one screw to the other straight, straightening out this end 
and then I spray paint on here with some, some bright paint the area that I need to cut out. Then I can just go back through at this point with um, a gravel shovel and just cut level back from the uh, footing all the way across. So we want to have a uniform thickness and a uniform width across this footing. So this is a great way to define that line. So using a flat blade shovel, I'll just cut out right along that line that we've marked. And I want to be sure to keep my shovel as flat as possible so that I'm coming out level from the bottom of my footing across here. So I start at the outside and create a level area and then move over from there and follow that area over to the line. And you can see it holds up pretty well because of the compaction. It will slough off a little. It's not a big deal at this point. It's, it's the difference between compacted rock and uh, concrete. So you want to be sure to have a, a footing that's wide enough. And at the same time, you don't want to worry about this stuff that falls in. We're going to run the compactor through here one more time to compact the bottom of this footing before we're all done. After we've cut out our footing, we want to go back with a hand tamper and compact any loose gravel that's come up in the bottom of the footing. Now, whether you're using the hand tamper or the plate compactor or really any kind of compactor, it's important to have the, the material that you're working just slightly damp. You don't want it to be wet, but you don't want it to be dry. With a little bit of moisture in there, it really helps the compaction. Otherwise, when it's dry, it just wants to separate, and when it's wet, it just creates all kinds of a squishy mess. So again, you want to just have things just lightly dampened. Now I'll walk down the whole footing here with the tamper, flattening it out as much as I can and just putting that last oomph on it before we go and get ready to set up for the pour. Now I don't want to hit too close to where I've cut this wall out along the orange line because it'll actually dislocate more than I'll compact. In order to ensure that our form boards are straight, I'm pulling a string line from one end to the other. The way I set this up is a screw back on the form board, pull your string across a wood block. If you have plywood, that works the best. Wood has a tendency to split out, but this is what we had on site. And then I have a second block at the other end and a third block in my hand. This third block I can use to slide and check the space between the form board and the string line, because I know it should be equidistant to this thickness right here because it's the same piece of wood. You want to secure the form in place about every three feet down the length of the form. Now, in order to check whether it is too far in or too far out, you run against the string line here with your block of wood. If, it's too, if the form boards are too far out, you'll come up to the string line and you won't be able to get the piece of wood between the string line and the form. So you know that you've got to actually push your form boards back in and brace them in position with an angle brace. Now, the opposite to that is you come up to the string and there's a large gap or even a small gap between the string and the piece of block wood. Now in that case, you need to pull your form back out. Same thing, you want to anchor it in place once it's pulled out into position. In that case, you may have to do a vertical stake and a horizontal or and a diagonal stake in order to firm it up in position. Now I've gone ahead and braced this off every three feet all the way down the form board. And uh, right now, where it's at, it's just perfectly sliding right past that string. So I can secure this in place now. Again, I took most of the bow that was in this board, came out uh, when I was around the middle area here. That's where the most flexibility in the board is. And that's all set. With the form board straightened now, I've come in and put a plaster relief on the inside here. What this is, again, we're doing a straw bale wall here, and we have an inch and a half of plaster on the outside of the wall. So what I want to have is a, a detail in the foundation where the concrete comes down, moves out, and goes down to the outside so that my plaster can then come right down and line up uh, close to flush with the outside of the concrete. So here I've used a two by two, screwed it into place about every two feet uh, at the top edge of the form. Then I put a little piece of electrical tape on here just to keep the concrete out of the, the uh, threads of the screw so I can actually get this thing off when I want to take the form out and I can reuse these again at a later date. Now if you have plumbing or electrical that you're wanting to bring into the building, you need to cut some trenches down below grade here. 
Uh, you need to check with your local code to find out what the depth of the trench needs to be for electrical and plumbing lines, and then come back into your building and run to wherever you need to go with those lines. That's important that you straighten your form boards first so that if you're targeting an interior wall to bring your plumbing line up in, for example, that you're coming from a square line off and measuring in the right direction. If you measure that distance and bring your lines in before you straighten your forms, when you actually build the house, you could be off with where that wall is placed. On top of your gravel, you want to lay a moisture barrier, which will stop water from wicking up through the insulation and then ultimately into the concrete and up into the house. So we use a six mil plastic. Careful when you step on this stuff, it's really slippery. We just spread this out over the slab. Like that. Now if you have any joints, if you're doing a larger structure and you have joints where the plastic is lining up with another piece of plastic, you can use uh, a water resistant tape like a duct tape or some type of water resistant tape to joint, to tape those joints uh, so you don't end up with moisture being able to get through those cracks and up into the slab foundation. Now on top of the plastic I've placed three inches of rigid foam insulation. It's important to use the extruded polystyrene insulation, which is uh, rated for structural uh, insulation. It can be placed underneath the slab. There are other types of foam that are designed for vertical installations along footings and, and edge walls, but they're not designed to hold the weight of the uh, concrete on top of them. And once I've installed those uh, at three inches, I'll have an R15 value underneath my slab. I've taped the joints with the uh, same tape as I talked about underneath. On the plastic, we're using a weather resistant or water resistant uh, duct tape, and that keeps this joint fully sealed. And this will, not only with the plastic below, but with this uh, insulation in the tape, will really eliminate any moisture from moving up through the slab. I've got sand on top of the insulation, and the, the major reason for this is it allows the concrete to cure uh, at equal rates in both directions. Uh, above the concrete, there's not a whole lot from stopping that moisture from coming out. And what'll happen if um, we have something that's water resistant right underneath the slab is it'll want to hold that moisture and it'll wick all the way through the concrete and dry unevenly. So this way the moisture can sink down into the sand and stay as a wet base and keep a slow cure for the concrete. I've gone ahead and used a screed board to get it level which is its second purpose is it becomes a leveling bed. Now I know I want three and a half inches of concrete so I used a two by four here and just ran it as a screed board down the sides and got it completely flat and leveled off. In order to eliminate cracking in your slab you want to put some kind of structural steel. Concrete has a great strength in the compressive direction, but in tensile strength it's very weak. So we use the steel to supplement the, the tensile strength of the slab. Now I'm using a, a welded wire mesh here as, uh, as my structural steel. You can also use rebar. Uh, in this case, this is something you can use where you don't need any specialty tools. You just need some wire cutters and uh, some gloves, basically. Now I'm using what's called adobe right here. This is a small uh, little block of concrete that has wire twisted coming out of it. And what you do is you, you attach the wire right to it, twist it down, and make sure these go down like that. What it does is that keeps the wire up off of the sand. As you pour the slab, if the, if the mesh is right down on the sand, it's not actually getting in between the concrete and you're not getting any extra tensile uh, strength out of it. So this way it keeps it up off of the sand, keeps it embedded in the concrete. Now this wire has a tendency to, to roll and to, and to bend up and, and kind of be hard to work with. So one of the other advantages of the, the dobies is you can hang them in places like out here off the edge. We can hang one in the air and as we pour the concrete it'll really pull that down and keep it down in the slab and stop it from peeling back up and coming out of the top of the slab. Whether you use the welded wire mesh or rebar you need to be sure to keep it away from the edge of the form boards. Now local codes will have uh, certain restrictions about how close to the edge of concrete you're allowed to get with your steel. Uh, I like to keep mine about six inches in from the, from the form board. The reasoning behind this is if it gets closer or actually uh, touches the outside of the form board, then you're going to get uh, moisture affecting it and rusting it out, and then it'll start to travel down the steel and decay the, all of the steel down that run. So if you keep a good six inches around the outside of your forms, uh, excuse me, between the inside of your forms and the outside of your wire, that's a good safe distance. Now you'll have a number of courses of this wire mesh that you put down and when you go from one course to the next you have to overlap them so that they become one solid unit of steel. So in this case I've just 
temporarily lash them together with the wire from the Dobe. Uh, and that gives me my nice overlap here and I can keep moving down. And then when I come back, I'm going to want to add more Dobies in places that are low. And on all my overlaps, I'll come back and tie every joint together so it makes one uniform piece of steel within the slab.